Chapter Two, Wonder Years. To make sense of my family's story, let's start at the beginning. On July 21st, 1986, I entered the world with a privilege that has shaped my entire existence. Because I was born in the United States, I received a gift guaranteed by the 14th Amendment of our Constitution, citizenship. My mother and father, or mommy and poppy, as I lovingly called them, and my big brother Eric would have done just about anything to have that blessing for themselves too. Mommy and Poppy worked, and I mean super hard. That's what it takes to make it in America as you're struggling for citizenship. From the time they arrived from Columbia, they accepted the sort of low paying jobs that make some people turn up their noses. Scrubbing toilets, painting houses, mowing lawns, mopping floors. The kind of work no one else wants to do. The kind of work we sometimes don't even notice is being taken care of. My dad Hector left for his shift as a restaurant dishwasher well before sunrise. At noon, he went to his job at a factory. Monday through Friday and sometimes on weekends, my father worked. It's how he made ends meet for us. My mother Maria did everything from babysitting to cleaning hotels and office buildings. When I was small, she took me along for her shifts. As she wheeled her supply cart through the aisles, stopping to vacuum and wipe, she let me wander. Put that back, Diane, she'd scold if she caught me touching things. Almost immediately, I'd be on to other mischief, swiveling in a chair and play typing, pretending I was a secretary. I could always entertain myself. My imagination came with me wherever we went. My parents came here as immigrants to make sure I had opportunities that weren't available in Colombia. I often took it for granted that even though they had very little, didn't know the area, and didn't have the same technology we have today like smartphones, Yelp, or navigation, they still managed to find cool places to take me and my friends. I remember how they found a great skating rink they would take us to and watch while we had fun on the ice. I think about those days often and how they tried to give us the very best and help us live the most normal lives as possible. When I think about skating in that rink, I realize how much they sacrificed. One of my favorite things to do when I was in elementary school was to find a spot on our sofa, curl up with the remote, and flip through my favorite shows. I also had this huge collection of Disney movies. I knew every character by heart, like Princess Jasmine, Belle, Simba, Cruella, and Pocahontas. Yeah, they were my homies. But kindergarten, I had become convinced I was Ariel from The Little Mermaid. I dressed like her, sang like her, and of course I knew all the details of her wish to escape from her life to another. Ariel was my kind of girl, a dreamer. How does your song go? My brother Eric teased me one Friday. Is it under the ocean? Shut up, I said, rolling my eyes, embarrassed. He overheard the rendition of Wish I Could Be Part of Their World uh, that I had recently hollered into my microphone. And by microphone, I mean my mom's hairbrush. Eric, who was 10 years older, kept an eye on me when our parents were out. Can you imagine growing up with a sibling who's a full decade older? It was like being an only child. When I think about it, when I was six, Eric was 16. That means for the most part, he did his thing and I did mine. He was cool taking me along with him, having my back. Come on, baby girl, he'd say when we scrounged up enough loose change from beneath our couch cushions. Let's go down to Chuck E. Cheese. There he played video games while I jumped myself silly in the inflatable bouncer. When we got home, we'd curl up in front of the tube again. When it came to TV hang time, Sundays were the best. Eric would mix up one of his chocolate shakes or fruit smoothies and we'd watch The Simpsons. It was our weekly tradition. My parents started early and worked long hours, but they made sure they usually finished work by dinner time. Family meals were important to us. At five, the smell of mommy's rice and beans, fried plantains, and sanchocho, a Colombian soup with corn and beef, wafted through our halls rising to mix with the sound of salsa music. My mother and father are both fantastic cooks. Mommy has her signature dishes and Poppy was always creating something new. 
sometimes adding an American, Chinese, Italian, or Dominican twist. One thing is for sure, our fridge was never empty. Poppy would always say we didn't have much, but at least we had food. I didn't ask for much, as long as he'd make my favorite weekend snack of octopus and fries. Poppy would cut a hot dog and slice it in half and slice it in the middle two ways so the hot dog looked like it had tentacles. And when fried, the tentacles would come out looking like an octopus. My dad always was doing fun things like that for me. I was easy to please. I'd eat pretty much anything as long as it had ketchup on it and if the foods didn't touch one another. Oh, that's delicious, my mother would declare upon tasting her creation. Then she prepared my plate. She'd pour the beans directly over the rice. Mommy, I'd protest, can you please keep them separate? Dinner was our time to catch up. It was always also my chance to take center stage. Once the family had gathered around the table, I'd belt out whatever Selena or Whitney Houston hit I'd just learned. And I will always love you, I sang one evening, lifting up an arm to add drama. My audience applauded as if I'd brought down the house at Madison Square Garden. That's wonderful, honey, Mommy exclaimed. After a few more ballads, Poppy would cut my concert short. That's enough, he'd say through laughs. He'd given me that sweet nickname of Chibola after he'd heard it on a Peruvian TV show. It's slang for my little girl, and that's what he called me. Whenever he said it, I cracked up. We moved a lot, but all within a small area of Boston. If the rent went up, we searched for somewhere more affordable. Our homes were small with tiny bedrooms. Eric usually had his own space, but until I was five, I slept with my parents. As I got older, mommy would create a makeshift bedroom for me, mattress and all, in the living room. Sometimes we lived in an apartment. Other times we were in a two-family house. I didn't care as long as we were together. We always made do with what we had. My mother did all she could to make our surroundings nice. She hung lacy curtains that she had gotten on sale. She spruced up the bathroom with a fluffy blue floor mat. On her days off, she dusted and organized the living room. She has a thing for scented candles. During the Catholic holidays, she'd line up a row of them, lighting each to fill our living room with a sweet smell. Mommy took pride in how our home looked and how she herself looked. She valued cleanliness as much as an honest day's work. She saved her pennies so she could occasionally splurge on a lotion or lipstick, and she kept her nails polished. And before bed, she brushed her dark shoulder-length mane until it was silky. Poppy was well-groomed, too. His short hair was swept neatly back, his mustache perfectly trimmed. He wore cologne daily. No matter how much they struggled with money, they made sure Eric and I always rocked at least one cool outfit. They taught us to make the most of what we had and to look our best. They also passed on an important lesson, that our bond with each other and our neighbors was the greatest treasure of all. In our community, we looked out for one another. When my parents or our neighbors' friends fled here from Columbia, they often slept on our floor. We need to help them get settled, Mommy would explain as she scooted over my mattress to make room for the visitors. Just as my parents, friends, and family had done for them, Mommy and Poppy would hook up newcomers with work, like cleaning or house painting, show them where to get affordable groceries, help them with English, listen to their stories from home, encourage them to get residence or citizenship that would allow them to live in the U.S. legally. At home and in the community, we all spoke a mix of Spanish and accented English. People with accents are often dismissed. It's assumed that they don't know the language well. The way I see it though, an accent is a sign of hard work and bravery, of stepping outside your comfort zone, learning a language that you weren't raised with. There's ambition in an accent, which I have always deeply admired. Between my nightly performances and Los Hermanos Lebron blaring from our radio, there was rarely a quiet moment. Did the noise annoy people on our street? Not one bit. In immigrant communities all over the globe, celebrating is part of the culture. It's part of survival. When your relatives are thousands of miles away, you make up for it by connecting with those around you who speak your language. Eat your food, love your music, honor your traditions. We showed up for one another's barbecues, baptisms, anniversaries, quinceaneras, and Thanksgiving and Christmas, 
off the chain. We partied our way from one home to the next. Halloween was my favorite holiday. It was a neighborhood get together that I had met my two closest friends. I was five. Mommy had recently befriended another Colombian lady, Amelia, who lived but nearby in Jamaica Plain. She was having a gathering just because. Colombians don't need a reason to party. Mommy brought me and that weekend I made my deb debut as Tinkerbell. Amelia's daughters, Gabriella, was also five and she was dressed as Snow White. Her cousin Dana was Minnie Mouse. When a flying fairy, a lovely princess, and a polka dot clad mouse came face to face, there's zero need for small talk. That's why I cut to the chase. Wanna dance, I asked. Both girls nodded and grinned. After we showed one another our best moves, there was no looking back. I had two, be two best friends for life. The next Halloween at a church costume contest, we expanded our BFF circle by one. Nice tutu. I smirked at a girl named Sabrina who'd shown up wearing the same white ballerina outfit I had on. I had a total chick stole my look moment. Like, come on, this girl's not gonna out ballerina me. We both bolted on that stage full throttle. 30 plies, sautés, and whatever else we were trying to pass off as ballet later. We both lost the contest. Sabrina and I realized there's no way to recover but to become besties. Mommy, I beg after school, can my friends come over? They can if you finish your homework, she'd say, cutting up a pepino cucumber ahead of supper. My mother's answer was all it took to send me scurrying to round up the girls. Some days I'd hang with Dana and Gabriella. Other times it was just me and Sabrina. But whenever the four of us got together, we were the ultimate hashtag squad goals. We rollerbladed, we rode our bikes, we splashed in the public pool, but mostly we lingered in the yard with our dolls so my parents could watch us. Every 30 minutes or so, I'd shuffle into Sweet Talk Poppy into giving me popsicles. You're not gonna be hungry for dinner, mommy would say disapprovingly, as if that could stop me. Sometimes when the world is spinning too fast, I close my eyes and recall those afternoons. Poppy sticking his head out the screen door simply to check on me and my friends. Mommy stirring her stew while humming and swiveling her hips to the rhythm of cumbia. Us girls lost in our laughter, disappearing into our world of dolls, books, board games, and imagination. Supper on the stove, music in the air, love all around. My wonder years.